Welcome to the Global Macro Panel. Clearly no shortage of issues so far this year as far as global macro is concerned. But I want to start with an audience question to get your participation. So I think you have a clicky thing, which is firmly tied <laughs> to the chair, clearly. And uh, we've got sort of four items that you can choose from. So the first one, central bank policy, rising inflation, wherever you choose to see it. Global trade, tariffs, US policy, China and emerging markets, the spillover effects there. And particularly prevalent or prevalent for this last couple of weeks, Eurozone, Italy, Brexit, the challenges Europe faces. So if you'd like to choose one of those, the biggest global macro issue, please do so. And that's where we'll kick off our discussion. Yeah. Probably could have figured in light of today's latest news, minute by minute. I want to kick off, Rebecca, with you. You anticipated this when we were talking earlier. Well, we have this G7 meeting later this week. We have ongoing negotiations with the EU, with Japan, with Mexico, with Canada, with China. So it is definitely front and center. And of the list there, it is perhaps the biggest global risk. Um, you know, I look at what we're facing this week and, um, you know, prior in my career, I used to liaise, as many investment banks did, with the Treasury Department as, as the U.S. prepared for G7 summit. So historically, the U.S. would write a draft communique, what the global view was going to be, present it to its global partners. The global partners would have an opportunity to opine, discuss language, and then it went out. So the U.S. led the rest of the, the members. Today is the first time I can recall in my adult life or perhaps even since the G7 started, where instead of the US leading the way, it's really the six versus us. And that's just fundamentally different. Is it going to be market moving? I don't know. But I think it does raise longer term issues about America's role in these global negotiations at a time where, frankly, we're still going to stay integrated. Global trade may slow down, but it's not reversing. The French finance minister said to us this week it was G6 plus one, ultimately. And yet markets, they're so... I think numb with all the headlines over this, they barely budge on the headlines. At what point do we start going, okay, now we need to price this or get more concerned about this? Because we're kind of sick of the headlines, I think, John. Yeah, I think, you know, from our perspective, I think the headlines are, are worse than probably what, what will actually happen. And I think that's why markets aren't necessarily responding to the latest tweet or the latest uh, news article. Uh, at the end of the day, it does seem like it's it's almost a ne negotiating tactic uh, that may even be working. So you know, we obviously there are lots of people at lots of tables. It's very different dynamic. But at the end of the day, we do believe that global trade will continue. There probably will be some, you know, we'll, we'll put some tariff on somebody. Uh, at the end of the day, China will probably have to endure something. Uh, but we, we think we'll, we'll end up in a relatively good place. Uh, and I think markets are seeing that. Even if we start slapping tariffs on each other globally, I can't, I can't help but imagine that we'd in some way at least start to price greater tensions going forward or an escalation of this, even if ultimately the tactic works. Neely, come in here. I think the market is in a place of show me, don't tell me. We've heard a lot. It's been interesting to watch since the 2016 presidential elections in the U.S. how the market has changed the way that it prices in geopolitical risk from period to period. Um, at Materan, we tend to be longer-term investors, yes. so um, you know we certainly don't want to react to uh, every headline, even if the market does. But one of the indicators or the measures that we've been following to measure um, how the market is digesting this information is to compare commodity prices, spot prices, or nearby futures prices of the commodities that are um, being debated in trade mm. relative to the stock price indices of the, the same types of commodities. And what we find um, in the case of the tariffs is that actually you do see in the spot prices some price spikes. Mm. Uh, but as you said, Julia, in the, in the stock prices, you don't see anything. Look at the example of steel. Yeah, um, aluminum. <laughs> steel, uh, if you look at nearby steel futures, the prices year to date are up almost 40%. Mm. Uh, but if you look at the NICE ARCA Steel Index, which is a global index of steel stocks, it's up like 5% year to date. Um, and S&P 500 steel stock index is up even less, like 3%. So the market is saying, show me, don't tell me. And I guess, you know, at Materan, we're saying the same thing. Is that being complacent in some way, Rebecca? Uh, no, because how do you price for uncertainty? So the reality you're faced with today is a very strong economic backdrop. That's real. We know it. We have data to actually prove it. 
whether we're looking at the non-farm payrolls from last week, the unemployment rate at 3.8%, or just this morning, the JOLTS survey for the month of April showed a record level of job openings. We also got um, service sector confidence today, which mm. continued to improve and we're close to cycle highs. The reality is that whether we look at the US or globally, we're robust. The trade is a risk, but it's not a reality. So you want to be cognizant of the risk. And if it plays out a certain way, what's the probability it plays out? And if it does play out in the worst possible case, what are you going to do to your portfolio to protect yourself? I think everyone needs to be thinking about that. But I certainly wouldn't be taking a big action on something that's just a risk. I think you can take an incremental step, but if you take too much, it's if the opposite of being complacent is overreacting to something that's unknown. So how do you? How do you reshape your portfolio? Well, I can briefly talk about what we've done. So we went neutral equities too early, about a year ago. And, and we did that because we thought we were getting later in the cycle. The Federal Reserve was starting to raise rates. Valuations were getting more stretched. So we wanted to take a baby step. We didn't want to be wily e. Coyote on the edge of the cliff, running off the cliff when, when the economy slowed down. So we made sure we stayed on the cliff. But we wanted to stay in the market, because at the end of the day, the economy is still growing. And the vast majority of sustained large equity falls happen into a recession. We're not there yet. But we wanted to take a little bit of profit off the table. So we went neutral equities. And then we've added some managed volatility strategies. And this isn't bond proxies. These aren't all high dividend strategies. But they're looking at portfolio diversification to reduce vol. Um, and those strategies have been averaging 10% a year for the last several years with 60% of the acqui vol. So they help us in periods like February. Yes. And then our overweight to the US and our overweight to tech, it's almost, I think we were talking about Neely inside, it's almost like a barbell. So even though we're neutral stocks, we're able to beat the S&P, we're able to beat the acqui and keep our volatility under control. So we've got the offset here of trade tensions, the concerns perhaps at some point that filtering more deeply into confidence. And this is what it comes back to as far as real economic impact. Then you've got a whole load of stimulus, mm. the fiscal policy, increased deficit spending as well. Mm -hmm. What's the balance between these two things? And is ultimately, and you gave me this actually, Rebecca, the idea the United States ultimately becomes the safe haven. Yeah, I think so. First of all, I'm, I'm a fixed income guy, yes, so I'll, pre I'll, I'll preface it with that. So, you know, sell all your equities. <laughs> no, and I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the <laughs> world talking, is bad. Take it, take it from a rates perspective, yeah, not yeah. the equities. So, uh, yeah, I think the, the audience, I, the, the second one on the list was was inflation and policy. And, I, and yes. from our perspective, we think that is the, the, the bigger risk than, mm. than global trade. Uh, the economy is humming, uh, particularly the U.S. economy. You know, our, our, uh, you know, we may see a 4% print on, on QT GDP. We're going to be close. It's going to be certainly at least, at least three, and it looks like uh, we, we've got a lot of head, uh, you know, headway. So everything looks good now, yes. but uh, we think that the, the Fed is going to be pushed into raising rates at the same time where you have more bonds that need to be sold into the market because we now we're going back to trillion dollar deficits. So we do think the, the, the risk of rising inflation, rising rates, tighter monetary, uh, monetary policy is the bigger risk uh, for us to contend with over the next year or so. And, uh, and that's how we're thinking about uh, constructing portfolios. Again, within a fixed income context, we think about exposure to interest rate risk. Yes. Uh, so for us, you want to be a little bit shorter. Uh, and then when you think about the credit markets, again, everything's good. You know, corporate earnings off the charts, fantastic. But you have the Fed in play, and you have margins that are that are still very high, but maybe peaking. And so, from our perspective, uh, the the next cycle could be quite painful from a, a credit perspective, maybe from an equity perspective as well. So you want to you, again, you don't want to be out of the market, but you want to be up in quality. So don't go for seven percent yields now. You don't need them. You know, the Treasuries are now yielding close to three, and are probably going to keep going uh, a, a little bit higher. Go for four or five, and you can have a portfolio that can give you a good return, certainly much better in the bond market than we experienced for the last 10 years, and, uh, and, and can feel pretty safe. Do you think the Fed surprises the market based on what we're pricing already? Because you're kind of talking well, about a significant inflation surprise, given everything that we've heard from the Fed, particularly with a, a less sensitivity to an inflation overshoot, perhaps, than we were anticipating even a month ago. Yeah, I think that uh, the Fed is not, you know, they're, they're trying desperately not to surprise anyone. It's interesting, right? So you had, you know, last year you actually had the Fed came through and did, you know, moved up rates uh, uh, quite a bit, and the market was not priced for that. 
So that was a surprise, but yet in the context of that, there was relatively low volatility, right? Long interest, long-term interest rates didn't even move all that much, really until this year. Short-term yes. interest rates just kept going up every single day. And so, but it was kind of done behind the scenes. So I think the Fed is trying to make it very clear what their reaction function is. If there is an upside surprise to inflation, yeah, then I think the markets will react quite negatively to that. We're not expecting some massive overshoot, mm. but we do think they're going to hit their target, and they'll probably go above the target. In fact, we're, we're pretty close to it already on the inflation side. I think people got so complacent, it's like, well, there'll never be inflation. And like, well, look, there, there kind of is a little bit. The debate still remains. Neely, come in here. Speaking of debate, I think we have a <laughs> professional debate on the panel. Really? Uh, so, and Mitterrand, we actually have a difference of a, a different opinion about the outlook for inflation. Um, the, the way that we look at it is we look at the way that um, different uh, industries in the economy are performing over time. And right now, um, we're seeing that a lot of the cyclical industries that tend to be harbingers of inflation, think about things like uh, chemicals, heavy machinery, um, metals, right, underperforming the stock market. And that what's leading the market? Tech. Um, the role of tech in driving inflation forces um, has actually been uh, deflationary, partially because of the way that a lot of new tech um, supports a more efficient price, it, price discovery process for consumers and businesses. Um, and so when we see these market dynamics, it's a signal to us that inflation may not be on the rise. Um, another thing, you know, then to think about is uh, how is the Fed going to look at all of this? It was interesting to take a look at the most recent Fed minutes, at um, which were released at the at the beginning of um, well, they, the the meeting was at the beginning of May um, when the Fed was talking about what they see as the greatest potential risks to the financial system, and they called out um, the record high levels of corporate leverage, mm -hmm. um, and there was a kind of a sense that the Fed is a little bit worried that if interest rates go too high, that the high, high level of corporate debt could actually become a major risk for the system. I think that this may cause them to hold back as well. Another thing that we're, that we're watching at the Fed um, is this uh, concept around R star, or you know, what, is, what is the true long-term kind of natural equilibrium rate um, when the economy is fully in balance, what would the real Fed funds rate be, um, net of inflation? And um, John Williams, who's just about to become the president of the New York Fed, moving over from San Francisco, um, has been a thought leader on, on our star, pointing out that that natural equilibrium rate has come down um, in the past 20 or 30, uh, 20 years or so by, uh, by, by um, 2%. It's a critical question because it raises at what point do you go from easing to neutral to tightening as far as monetary policy is concerned. And the Rebecca? Fed, yeah, the Fed has, you know, it's working without full information right now to the point you made um, on technology being somewhat deflationary. You know, this is a, it's not a new phenomenon, but it's relatively new. Some of the deflationary forces we're seeing. And how does the Fed incorporate that in their analytics? How do you forecast the pace of change that's going to happen going forward? No one knows. Some people argue that the technology deflation will slow from here. Some people think it'll pick up. But without knowing, they're making very educated guesses. They have armies of PhDs, but at the end of the day, they're educated guesses. So there is room for policy error from the Fed. So I think it's an important thing for us to think about when we listen to the Fed. They're making their best educated guess. There's also been more tightening than just rate hikes as well. For if sure. you look at a bit of strength in the dollar, we look at the ramp up in front end rates. I mean, you could add, right. given Credit the balance sheet, yeah. exactly, balance sheet reduction, you could add maybe another one percentage point, 250 basis points of time. And that's also closing. unprecedented. So right. we haven't lived through that before in modern financial markets. So some, I think some buy side, sell side shops are suggesting that this is a significant part of tightening and we aren't giving it enough due. And others are saying, no, it doesn't really matter. Just focus on short-term interest rates. But a point you made, Jonathan, that I couldn't agree more with is on credit. Um, and for anyone who has as high as it's ever been, the rating agencies, again, think of 07, again, the rating agencies are kind of involved. Again, they're, they're letting these massive uh, companies with much more leverage than what you would have had for a, say, triple B company still be triple B because there's an expectation of deleveraging. And again, as long as everything is good, they will delever and everything will be fine. But when the music stops, I do think it's going to be pretty ugly. And one wrinkle when the music stops, in the last cycle, it was largely the banks issuing this debt. 
Today, the banks aren't issuing as much of it. Yeah. It's been dispersed more towards hedge funds and private mm -hmm. equity shops that aren't regular or asset managers who aren't regulated the same way. So if we come to a day where the tide goes out, how are these um, players going to function? Are they going to feel compelled to make markets? Are they going, they're not regulated the same way? How are they going to be treated? Um, private equity leverage, that's another source of risk that wasn't there in 08. So there's some history rhymes, but doesn't repeat. I think you, you need to be cognizant of the issuers of this debt as well as the level of debt out there. I want to talk about Europe, so I want to mm. move on. But speaking very quickly, of debt. Speaking of debt, <laughs> but, um, what kind of time frame are we talking about? Just very quickly oh, on that. April 13th, when that becomes 2.30 p.m., <laughs> yeah, the recession no. will start. Sorry, had to ask. Let's move on to Europe. Two years, three years? You know, I go back to the Fed. If you look historically, okay. going back to the 1970s, mm -hmm. there have been different triggers for recessions. And again, the vast majority of sustained equity bear markets come as you enter a recession. So all of us want to spend a lot of time trying to understand how close we are to that, that moment. We can't time it, but we can understand the risks and the excesses. And nine times out of 10, the trigger for that recession is interest rates. It's inflation that forces the Fed's hand and the higher borrowing costs lead us into that downturn. So focus on the Fed. How important is Italy, Eurozone, particularly as far as interest rates are concerned, when you've still got ultimately the ECB buying Eurozone? Well, the fact well, that, not the fact for much that longer. I think it was, what, 5% well. of the audience had Italy yes. as, as their yes, top yes. risk makes me think it's a big risk. Um, <laughs> You know, um, we're in uncharted waters here in that the populist parties now leading Italy, we don't know what they're going to do. Again, it's not a reality, it's a risk. But there's two things I'm personally going to be keeping an eye on over the summer and into early fall. One is, do they revise their economic forecasts and their budget projections, which they will submit at some point before the end of September to the EU. And if you recall, that's kind of what kicked off the Greek crisis. The new Greek government came in and said, oh, you know those deficit projections? We're going to get our deficit down? Yeah, that's over. We're, we're not doing that. And that's when everyone said, oh, my god. Um, so there's a risk Italy could play that card. The other one is rolling back pension reforms. Either of those things, fiscal stimulus is going to push up their debt, which is already 132% of GDP, fine, most of it's loaned, owned locally. But there is a dynamic between the government debt and the banks, which I think is somewhat toxic. And the other problem going on is that um, third biggest economy in Europe, but Germany, our anchor, mm. Angela Merkel, I think, was hoping this last term of hers would be her legacy moment to strengthen EU. But after her election outcome, she can't look out. She has to look in and make sure the CDU and CSU is in a safe place for when she's gone. So she's focused on structural reforms at home. Um, social spending, helping the middle class, having a tighter immigration policy, she's not going to be able to come to the aid of Italy the same way we might have seen in the past. Yeah, I'm just not sure any other nation wants more Europe anyway. Neely, come in here because I know you've been investing in Europe, so you see opportunity here where perhaps others don't. Yeah, we actually added uh, to our positions in Eurozone stocks at the beginning of the month. Um, it, I, I, we actually, I actually don't see the risks um, of the coalition between Lega and Five Star Movement in Italy being able to work together effectively as being as high uh, as some other thinkers have presented it. Um, coming into the elections, originally they had quite different policy platforms. Lega is more of a nativist party, whereas Five Star Movement is more populist anti-establishment. And some of their priorities, especially when it comes to budget, where are the Euro is going to come from um, are quite at odds. Mm. Uh, and they don't have enough of a majority necessarily to be able to push through um, everything that both parties want to do in parliament. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how much they're able to get done effectively. I think, you re remember when it seemed uh, recently that they were going to call for a snap election? Um, and that was when the markets really got worried because there was a concern that maybe the Italian voters would look at this new coalition favorably and that they would be able to build more of a position, um, of, of a majority position than they have right now. And then the markets really calmed down when they said, oh, no, we actually have formed a coalition government. And I think that it's because the markets are kind of looking and saying, we don't know how much you're actually going to be able to get done. The market had a habit of taming populists and has had a, a, a habit of taming populists in the past. But you think actually QE ends, the ECB ends 
quantitative easing this year? They either end it entirely or it becomes much smaller and maybe yeah. they had, there's a, there's a tail, but uh, essentially it's, it's definitely going to wind down because it has to, not necessarily because they want to. And I agree with most of what you said. I think that there will definitely be constraints in terms of what policies you could actually implement because either whether it's the ECB uh, or the European Commission or the markets, even more so, that are going to basically uh, you know, disallow uh, an, an increase in debt, and the ECB is not going to be there mm. to, uh, to, to pick up the, uh, uh, all those bonds. So our view is, this is the, like the cat is out of the bag on Italy, you know, and th th this was interesting because again, it's sort of like we're repeating similar mistakes, right? So you had the Greece crisis, the Greek crisis, and uh, everyone said, oh, before that, the, all these European government bonds, even the indebted nations, mm. they're rate products, right? So in, the, in fixed income world, we think of there's rate products and credit products. The, all these things were rate products, so you got a little bit of spread, that's fantastic. Then they realize, hey, there's some credit risk associated with this. This is a credit product. Well, rate products, you know, like 100% of your portfolio. Credit products, you have like 2%. So there was a huge shift, and that's why we saw the European uh, crisis. But the ECB and Germany all came in. They're not going to do that again for several reasons. First of all, they're full, uh, and politically, I think it's difficult. And second of all, Italy has more bonds than Germany. Yes. So it, the, Italy is significantly uh, a much bigger problem than, than Greece. So again, agreed, they're not going to just blow it all up. But there's good. But in our view, that spike you showed the chart there. Uh, we're not going back to where we were. We think Italy will now be seen for some stretch of time, uh, maybe maybe forever, uh, as a credit pro product and not a rate product. Well, good news, bad news. Italy has had more than 60 governments since the end of World War II. So wait a couple months and maybe it'll change. <laughs> I know again. you said to me, bottom up, you don't worry because they just yeah. carry on regardless. I've heard that many times. We have less than a minute left. Speed round. Yeah, well, is this a good time to be making money? Is this opportunistic? And what's your biggest concern? Just as a snapshot, is it higher volatility? Is it being surprised with US policy? The midterms, we haven't even talked about them. Very quickly, you have like one sentence. Rebecca, I'll start with you. Oh, Sorry. One sentence. Um, mm -mm. I think my biggest fear this year would be, yeah. and I, I'm not expecting this, but the risk that I think would get people most unnerved is a faster than expected rise in inflation. Yeah. Inflation is ultimately the concern. Neely? Uh, I think it's a great time to be an investor. Um, if you're in a market where a lot of people are fearful or a lot of people are greedy, but we happen to be in one where both of those are true, um, <laughs> where people are excessively short-term focused, which was discussed on some earlier panels, yeah. it's a great time to find uh, moments where investors are mispricing assets. And if you're able to stay sober, focus on your discipline, do the analysis, and apply it, um, you can uh, find great opportunities to win. <coughs> yeah, well, from our perspective, it's a fantastic time to make money. We had seven years where our money market funds we had zero, That's literally right. zero. <laughs> Those things are at 2% now, so yeah. we're really, really excited. But we, uh, so, uh, but I would say, look, I, you know, again, I, I think there are some risks that are out there, and yeah. we talked a lot about them. And uh, so our view would be, Yes, there's now a yield in the market. You can actually get some income from a high quality, relatively short maturity bond portfolio, and that's what we think people should do. Awesome. Guys, your panel. Oh, thank you. Keep back on.